Apakah ada pertanyaan lainnya dari para hadirin? Thank you. I have a question um, about uh, evidence presentation in Singapore Arbitration Center. Uh, how to present the evidence? Uh, is it have to be an original document or is it known to present an expert in SIAC and what is, what are the qualifications to present the uh, expert in the arbitral process in Singapore and the second question is can be can foreign arbitration uh, chambers uh, non non international like um, bani uh, to be enforced in Singaporean court thank you Yeah, thank you for your question. I think that um, for your first question about how do we present evidence or admit evidence into the arbitration proceedings, right? Uh, unlike in litigation where you have uh, you know, various kind of procedures on what kind of evidence can be admitted and all that, you know, in arbitration is relatively uh, lax and generous. Most of the time, evidence that couldn't have been admitted under the strictures of uh, national litigation might actually be admitted in uh, arbitration because the arbitrator ultimately has discretion as to what it considers the evidence to be relevant or not. And we are guided by the IBA uh, guidelines on evidence, you know, and in it, you know, they set out several articles, I think 9.3 or something or 9.4 of, of that, sets out, you know, um, evidence can be admitted if it is considered to be relevant but they cannot be admitted if they are, say, legally privileged or, you know, subject to some national security or, or uh, confidentiality and all that. So, um, the, so I guess the, 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 the short answer to your question is that uh, we are guided by the IBA rules on uh, evidence and the general admission of uh, e evidence, you know, whether they have to be original copies or not, uh, they don't have to be original copies. You know, you can just send a photocopy of it. And if the party alleges there's fraud or anything, then that's a, a different issue altogether. But you don't have to get all the physical copies and send it to the arbitrator. Soft copies could do, you know, uh, photocopies of those uh, can do as well. Um, I think then your uh, second question is about whether um, Barney uh, arbitration can be enforced uh, in, in Singapore. And that really relates to the New York Convention. So long as the arbitral award fulfills the uh, you know, New York Convention that it is uh, an international arbitration award, meaning that it has two different parties, you know, not of the uh, same nationality, uh, and uh, they are in writing, they fulfill all the other requirements that I mentioned earlier, it can be enforced. So it's not necessarily that oh, if it's a Barney arbitration, then you, know, you can't enforce it. You know, it, it really depends on the content, the substance of the uh, arbitration award, who are the parties involved and all that, whether they fulfill the criteria set out in the New York Convention for enforcing of award. Yeah, thank you. Silahkan, apabila ada pertanyaan lainnya. Yes, silahkan. Um, thank you for such a great uh, presentation. So, there is a case where the party wants to execute the personal guarantee, but uh, the, SI, the SIAC already say that this corporate guarant this personal guarantor need to pay to the plaintiff but there is an issue where uh, the deed of guarantee has been made in Singaporean law but the main contract said that the applicable law is Indonesian so is Singapore uh regulate this dual applicable law such as this uh case thank you uh, that's a difficult question i think it, a lot of it depends on the fact for example you mentioned a uh, personal guarantee you know of, of, of sorts it depends on whether the personal guarantee itself contains an arbitration clause and whether the main agreement itself contains an arbitration clause because those are separate uh, separate uh, contracts. So for example, if the personal guarantee uh, contains a governing law that is Singapore law and the main contract says, for example, is Indonesian law, then you know, they, I don't think that there's an issue of uh, wrong law being applied because they are quite specific to which, uh, uh, which particular uh, document the arbitration agreement is contained in. 
But I think you know, like in the event that uh, say at an arbitration happens and you know parties for some reason apply both parties you know uh, mistakenly apply hey, the substantive law uh, which I think does not really happen I, I think it's quite difficult for both parties to apply the wrong substantive law because there are a lot of checks and measures before you get to that stage you know you have to state what is the governing law you know when you file the notice of arbitration the SIEC will look at it uh, the tribunal will look at it, both parties, council will look at it. So I think it's quite unlikely that the substantive law will be wrongly uh, applied. But that being said, you know, there can be circumstances where the governing law says, for example, Singapore law, but both parties want it to be Indonesian law and it can be done. See, arbitration is all about party autonomy and party consent and agreement. If both parties want the governing law to be Indonesian law, despite the con contract saying Singapore law, that can be done. You know, we just have to you know, write it down in a written agreement that both parties agree that uh, governing law that should be applied to this arbitration is Indonesian law. And that's it. You know? So that's the beauty of arbitration that you know, as long as both parties agree to it, you, know, you can sort of alter and change you know, the, the terms of the uh, arbitration itself. Yeah, hope that answers the question. That's an interesting case. Uh, the uh, she asked us before. There's a follow-up question. Oh, okay. So how about to execute the CIAC uh, decisions then after there is uh, dual applicable law in this case? Um, I think that uh, say you know in the I'm not sure of what the uh, facts of your case is you know I mean you can feel free to uh, speak to me afterwards about it if it's not uh, you know uh, convenient to share more about the facts but I think that you know if, like what I mentioned if the factual scenario is that if there are two main agreements each with different governing law each with their own arbitration agreement then what happens is that if a dispute arises under both of them you uh, you actually get two different uh, arbitration tribunals constituted. And uh, what happens in this scenario is that uh, there is an option of consolidation that we call an arbitration consolidation. If they, under the arbitral rules, they find that these two are related contracts, you know, what happens is that you can actually consolidate uh, both of them. And then that raises this question that then brings about this scenario and situation that you raise. Oh, so after consolidation of these two uh, different arbitration uh, arbitrations together, and each of these documents says a different substantive law, what do we do about it, right? But I think that uh, I, this actually happened in one of my arbitration cases. And what we did was that, you know, we sort of had to be very clear about what were the issues in dispute. So let's say if there's a dispute or breach of breach of the main agreement itself and let's say let's say that's governed by Indonesian law we will set out very clearly in the list of issues to the arbitrator we say that you know uh, this breach will be governed by Indonesian law and then the other question would be and then let's say for personal guarantee let's say Singaporean law then we'll say that you know the breaches of the personal guarantee contract you know these will be governed by uh, Singapore law and so you know the interesting thing is that then this arbitrator has to decide on uh, or have the ability uh, to touch on two types of substantive law. And, and it, it sort of seg segues uh, you know, very nicely into this other point that I, I didn't mention earlier, which is that unlike in litigation, where you want to produce uh, foreign law evidence, you know, you have to get like a you know a sworn affidavit by an expert, you know, of let's say this particular foreign law. Uh, but then in arbitration, it's considered pleaded uh, as uh, uh, meaning that you don't have to have uh, say in an Indonesian uh, uh, governing law arbitration, you don't have to have Indonesian lawyers arguing it. 
you can actually have Singapore lawyers arguing Indonesian uh, law <laughs> for that matter. It may seem very strange, but uh, that actually happens pretty often. And what they do is that they get uh, they co-counsel. For example, we could co-counsel with SIP and they can advise us on what is the Indonesian law aspect of it. And we work on this matter together uh, because, you know, for example, we are needed because let's say we have more arbitration experience or because it's seated in Singapore. So we need to know some of the implications that it might have. Uh, but to get back to you, your, your question, how, what, what happens if there is an issue in an arbitration where two substantive laws have to apply can really be quite easily resolved by sort of limiting, identifying what are the actual questions for each substantive law. You know, you set them out very clearly that you know, for this question, Indonesian law must apply. For this other question, Singapore law must apply. So it's not to read, no, you don't see that in uh, litigation. But I see in arbitration, that's the beauty of it, that flexibility to try and resolve uh, question, uh, issues and disputes you know, in a very cost efficient manner. Yeah, thank you. Apakah ada pertanyaan lainnya? I think if I may ask a question you mentioned before about hot tubbing of expert witnesses i think it's very interesting because under indonesian law um, there is no uh, such act of responding to another expert witness's statement once expert witness already submits statement and, and that's it and it also happens uh, to us under the Swiss jurisdiction as we have submitted with an expert statement and then the, the counsel uh, for respondent uh, asking us to respond to another uh, expert witness statement it's, it's, uh, it's new to us and uh, how is the limitation of act of responding to the witness statement and how uh, what is the special reason on or what is the ground of doing such uh, hot tubbing witness statement uh, what is uh, the the special reason I think that that's the the question to, the, the grounds yes yeah. Thank you, Hannah, for you know illustrating you know this issue of expert evidence. You know, like having to send expert evidence back and forth. You know, asking different questions, and you know, when it's just simply much easier if you ask the two of them to fight it out and argue it, isn't it? Yeah. So that's really the purpose of the hot tubbing procedure. You no, know, we want to circumvent you know this back and uh, forth of like lawyers cross-examining experts and all that and you know asking tricky questions and all that we just want to do away with that have both uh, experts you know uh, sit together and before a tribunal explain why their views are a certain way and so one of the ways when we do hot tubbing is that we create what is called a scots schedule a scots schedule is essentially uh, contains the list of questions or disputes between the two expert uh, uh, experts and they were, and it was set out, you know, uh, what is the say a claimant's expert's view on this particular point, the what is the respondent's expert's uh, particular view on this point, do they agree or not? So it, and so you know it sort of eliminates areas where they already agree and allows us to focus on the areas where they do not agree and the reason why. And so when they sit together, you know, and hot and and have a hot tubbing session, you know, you sort of bypass the tricky you no know, uh, cross-examination questions that you have and what you get is really the experts like views on this you know and you know sometimes experts may be faced with a particular position you know which is you know very weak and it shows in hot tubbing you know when you know when they ask this question you know both sides are supposed to give their answer and it shows very clearly when an expert is struggling to explain why he takes a certain view or not because there's this other expert right there ready to contradict him, you know, in case that, you know, he gives a, a different uh, answer. And one of the implications, unfortunately, as good as this, you know, whole hot tubbing may be, what happens is that there's also dynamics in, in uh, between the experts, you know, and it becomes a question of like expert shopping, where each party tries to get the most qualified, most eminent expert in this area, to try and dominate that discussion during the uh, hot tubbing process, yeah. So that you know, it's one of the side effects of uh, hot tubbing, unfortunately. Yeah. Thank you. 
perhaps I can just add on to what Derek said. I think what he said applies to arbitration. But even in the Singapore courts, hot tubbing is something that's encouraged. In medical negligence cases, which I do, I mean, sometimes we see hot tubbing in action. It is helpful because it really forces the experts to really narrow down to what they don't agree. All right, and then you have the court, of course, then trying to determine between the two experts in terms of areas of disagreement, who is more compelling or cogent. All right, so that is pretty much practice in our courts. So it's not just exclusive to, I think, uh, you know, arbitration. Another phenomenon in Singapore court is that under the new rules of court, which I mentioned just now, our courts would prefer parties, if possible, to try to appoint a single expert. Right? Because sometimes when you have experts, they really take up a lot of time. And sometimes it may not be productive you know, use of time. So that is the inclination of our courts. As far as possible, parties try to agree on one expert. If parties cannot agree, then the court will appoint an expert. So that's the kind of development in Singapore. As our time is up, uh, maybe Mr. Acton and Mr. Derekia would like to um, say a, a closing statement to the audience. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know I was in an arbitration, I had to submit closing uh, statements. But I guess my closing remarks would be that um, for uh, you know, members of the audience here, you know, if you deal in commercial contracts with international parties, odds are very likely that you know you would have an arbitration uh, agreement in it. And you know, I strongly advise that you know uh, when you try to create new commercial agreements with international parties and all that, do pay a bit of attention to the arbitration agreement. You know, look at where the seat of arbitration is. You know, after today's session, you know, you know all the areas to look out for, and you know, try to draft and uh, try to agree on an arbitration agreement that would be favorable, you know, to your client or your, to your company, because the arbitration agreement sets the tone for the arbitration. You know, half the battles we really won if you are able to draft it uh, properly. So, uh, so I guess my closing remark is to try not to, you know, just ignore the arbitration agreement because everything is all fine and dandy until, you know, there's a dispute that arises and all of a sudden we find ourselves with a bad arbitration agreement. Yeah. On my part, I would just want to thank you again for being a very captive audience. Um, in terms of ease of doing business in Singapore, I think just now you've had, uh, you know, you heard my presentation. Really, it's not difficult to start up shop there. There are a lot of opportunities, as you can see from what I've detailed earlier. All right, so do try to look for those opportunities. And I think what is important is to have a safe pair of hands, uh, you know, to guide you along when you need to invest in Singapore. Of course, SIP law firm <laughs> should be your first point of contact and uh, through us. Don Berg, we will be happy to help you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Erickson and uh, Mr. Dirakia for the uh, short, for the closing statement. Uh, Ibu dan Bapak dan Ibu sekalian, dalam diskusi kali ini dapat disimpulkan bahwa Singapura sudah menjadi business hub bagi para pengusaha dengan berbagai keuntungan di antaranya terkait dengan kejelasan regulasi ataupun a strong role of law. Terutama regulasi terkait penyelesaian sengketa, di mana para pengusaha memiliki tendensi untuk menyelesaikan sengketa melalui arbitrase di Singapura, baik SIIC ataupun ICC, mengingat berbagai keuntungan dalam memilih arbitrase sebagai forum penyelesaian sengketa, seperti prosedur yang fleksibel, confidentiality, dan pelaksanaan putusan arbitrase melalui New York Convention. Ladies and gentlemen, since our discussion has come to an end, I, uh, the moderator of this discussion, would like to thank to our speakers for their enlightening, enlightening and informative uh, presentation, and all for all of the guests for the active engagement. Finally, please uh, give our warmest applause to Mr. Erickson and also Mr. Derekia for the presentation.